each time you sit down to meditate, remind yourself this is the most important thing you can be doing right now. And it's the most important skill you can develop in your life. The ability to drop all your other concerns and focus on what really is your responsibility, which is the shape of your mind. It's so easy for us to talk about how we're responsible for things outside, and that's part of our goodness. But where does that goodness come from? It, if you're responsible for things outside, you're doing a horrible job, creating suffering for yourself and suffering for other people. It's nothing to be proud of. You have to give precedence to your mind, the state of your mind. That it's not something that's going to be good on its own. It needs training. It needs nourishment, the proper kind of nourishment. All too often we nourish ourselves with thoughts of our own importance. Thoughts of sensuality, thoughts of who knows what. And that kind of food is not necessarily good for the mind. Because many times those thoughts can poison whatever good you do have. The Buddha gives us an example of someone who's practicing concentration and starts thinking about how his concentration is better than other people's concentration. And that immediately, right there, spoils it. Well, that same issue doesn't apply only to concentration. It can apply to anything else you do in life. You could do it well, but then you build up a lot of pride around it. It's like taking good nourishing food and then spreading something poisonous or something rotten over the top. For the goodness of the mind really to be good, it has to come from within from a sense of its own inner sufficiency, its own inner strength, its ability to nourish itself properly. And then the goodness it does outside naturally just comes. It's a natural expression of the mind. And it's more likely to be right for the occasion and not harmful to anybody. So to really be responsible, you have to take responsible <clears throat> you have to take responsibility for this, the state of your mind right now and your ability to protect it, look after it. This means you have to give it a lot of attention. It also means you have to be willing to put aside a lot of other connections in your life. When Bu Tai was here this past couple of days, this is one of the themes he repeated over and over again, is our need to be quiet and need for restraint. The need to focus on what really is our responsibility is the shape of our mind. And no one else can do this work for us. You see this when you're dealing with other people, people you love are suffering, and there's something in them that you can't reach. Say when someone is really, really sick, or really miserable, really depressed, and you just can't reach them, or someone, someone's dying. And you realize if that person had taken care of his or her own mind, He or she would not be suffering, and we would be suffering a lot less. You wouldn't be concerned. You wouldn't be worried. So this is your number one responsibility, your sh shape of your mind right now. And the goodness of the mind is something that doesn't need to be decorated. It doesn't have to have a lot of pride or conceit around it. I mean, there's a certain amount of pride and conceit that you need to take as you're developing it. But as it gets better and better, you find that they're really unnecessary. You can put them aside, because the goodness of the mind in and of itself is its reward. So we focus on the breath, try to bring the mind to, first, as the Buddha says, a state of seclusion. You put aside any unskillful thoughts that come up. You try not to get entangled with concern that they are arising as a blemish on your ego, what the hell, they're here. But you don't have to get involved with them. 
they're going to come, then they're going to go. You just don't have to get involved. And you learn how to pull away from them. It's not that you're in denial of them, it's just you don't have to participate in what stories they want to get you involved in. You see them come, and then you just watch them go. You've got a place to stand here with the breath, try to make the breath as comfortable as possible. This is your nourishment on the way to getting the mind in really good shape. This is energy field in the body that allows the breath to come in, allows it to go out, nourishes the nerves, nourishes the blood vessels, allows the body to move. That's your most direct experience of the body. And yet we tend to look past it interpret and see it as being the solid parts of the body or whatever, and then wonder how we can get breath to go through the solids. Actually, the breath is already there. In fact, as far as our awareness is concerned, the breath is primary. It comes first. That's why when the breath energy is flowing well, it really is nourishing to the mind because it's so near to the mind. It fills your awareness of the body with a sense of comfortable breath energy. And when that sense of well-being comes, then you're in a much better position to look at your own drawbacks and not get ensnared in all the stories and back-and-forth recriminations that come when you notice you've got something unskillful going on. Because you realize you don't have to identify with it. It's just something that's there. Causes have created it, and when the causes are removed, it's going to go away. And one of the big causes, of course, that keeps it going is you're paying attention to it, your desire to get involved in it. So you can learn how to drop those things. Then all these distractions and other things that pull you away from centering in on the mind don't have a foundation, and they slip away, slip away. And part of the mind will say, well, you're missing this, you're missing that, and there's a lot in the world that you're missing, but you're not really missing anything if, you're, if you haven't taken care of the mind first. Because this is your top responsibility. You can't put it off to when you're old, you can't put it off to weekends or whatever. You've got to do it every day, because the mind can create trouble every day. So you've got to keep riding herd on it. But riding herd doesn't mean that you're causing it to suffer. You're actually giving it a sense of well-being, I mean, learning how to protect it, learning how to have a, have a sense of its value. This is where all our goodness comes from. This is where the potential for an end to suffering comes from. Of course, the suffering that we're creating with our minds right now, that's the problem. But you solve the problem where the cause is. And it turns out, in the midst of this cause, there is something that's deathless, something that doesn't die. It's a different dimension. It's outside of space and time. The Buddha doesn't talk much about it. He says it's something you realize. We're talking today about trying to get our heads around the idea of what this deathlessness of the mind might be like. And it's not one of those things you get your head around. You try to get your head around suffering. So you can comprehend it to the point where you can develop dispassion for it. As for the cause of suffering, you try to abandon it. But the end of suffering, the cessation of suffering, you don't have to comprehend it. You discover it. It's there. And regardless of how wonderful your theories are about it and how accurate your ideas may be about it, there's no way they can touch the actual reality of this potential there, of this dimension. But we can talk about developing the path using the strength we gain from concentration to look into the ways in which we're causing suffering and learn how to abandon them, and look into the most paradoxical part of the mind, which is that it likes to create suffering. We want to understand why is this happening. We want happiness. We want pleasure. 
at the things we do end up creating so much suffering, and we are attached to things that are causing suffering because we don't see the connection. We don't think there's any alternative. And so when the Buddha does talk about the cessation of suffering, he tells us enough to let us know that it's really good and it's really worth going for. And it's much better than all the other ideas we have about who we are and how great we are and how important we are or how horrible we are. All these stories that, whether we're, thinking we're good or bad, we're making ourselves the hero, we're making ourselves the heroine. None of them are helpful. You want to look into the state of your mind right now. How is it dealing with itself? How is it dealing with its thoughts, its, its cravings? How is it dealing with the good parts of the mind? What is it doing to maintain them, to give them importance? Those are the questions you really want to ask, and those are the ones you want to focus on. This is by focusing on them that you can find something really good in the mind. And when you've got that real goodness, then you don't have to create all the artificial forms of goodness that we build around our self-image or idea of how important we are in this way or that way. The Buddha talks about the different levels of generosity that come along as we're practicing, and they get higher and higher. And to finally get to the state of being awakened, and then generosity is just a natural ornament to the mind. In other words, the goodness we do for other people at that point, it's not because we want something out of them or we want something out of being good. When the mind is taking care of all of its needs, taking care of all of its inner responsibilities. Everything that's left is a pure gift. This is why this should take priority. And as for anything that gets in the way, anything that distracts you from this, you've got to put it aside for the time being. It's like learning a musical instrument. You have to be willing to go and practice for hours and hours and hours by yourself. If you're not playing for anybody, it may sound like you're being selfish, but no, you're learning how to get really good at it. So when the time comes down, you actually do go out on the stage, you've got something good to show. You've got something good for people to listen to. Like the Buddha, he left his family, and many people get upset about that. He was a deadbeat dad. But you have to remember that one of the ways that a husband father could provide for his family in those days was to go out on an expedition, go out exploring someplace, come back with a treasure. And sometimes it would take years. In this case, the Buddha came back with a really great treasure, the treasure of the deathless. And so even though he had to isolate himself from his family and it caused them some grief, he himself found it hard to leave, but he knew that he had to. But when he came back, he had something that more than compensated for those six or seven years. So remember this when you find that the demands of the practice actually demand that you be willing to get away from your family, get away from your friends. It may look like you're being irresponsible, but actually you're actually taking care of your number one responsibility. And when you do that, everybody benefits. And whether anybody else appreciates that fact, that doesn't matter. You know that this is what you've got to do.